Welcome to It Is What It Is. I'm Sean Marie. Hopefully everybody's had a beautiful week. So real quick, I just want to say some things like real fast and then we'll get right into it. But anywho, so isn't it kind of fucking weird that they put this like whole mask mandate thing on the stores and whatnot. And then if you just throw a big enough fit, you don't have to go through with it. I just think that shit's ridiculous. Like I am being pretty much forced to wear a mask while I work. And like, I don't know if it's because I'm a little chunky or I don't, I got some, I got asthmas or whatever the situation is, but like your girl fucking dies, right? Like sweaty, my upper lip all sweaty. I got fucking like face acne. It's all sorts of stupid. But really, if I just throw a big enough bitch fit and like embarrass myself, I think I can get away with not having to wear one like everybody else does. Well, not like people I work with because like legitly they ain't playing. They're like, wear the mask or go home until the end of COVA. And who the fuck knows when the end of COVA is. And originally I was one of the people who were like, I don't even know nobody that has COVA. But recently my best friend who I've known since I was a child, who used to be my babysitter, has the COVA. So and she says it sucks so like she can't taste anything from what I understand or like, sm I don't know. That sounds like it fucking sucks. So hopefully she gets better. But like now I know somebody with the COVA. My brother-in-law who lives in California had to go get tested because somebody at his work. So it's like legit. Like I understand wear the mask, protect yourself. Yeah. And then there's the people that say don't wear the mask. It's bad. I'm with y'all because this shit sucks. And mainly I'm with you because it sucks. And then another thing that has baffled me this week and I think we need to hurry up and come up with a solution to this shit because this is just bad this will take a lot of people's monies away and that's just sad is this chain shortage thing blows my mind mainly because when I went to Washington we went to some strip clubs up there fun time great time highly recommend but anywho those women make more money than I do in a month and they deserve it. The dances they do, the time they spend to practice, the pole thingy, wrapping your legs around that, slipping, the chicks that can shoot the balls out, the ping, ping, ping. Very talented. Okay. Those are not easily done things. And I know that they have like the butt plug with like the square card on it. So like you can swipe the card, but then you still have to take the time out, get the app, charge him, whatever. I think we really need a slider thingy that goes like in the titties or something. Like a cute little holster that our boobs can go around. We can slide the card. Like we cannot not pay our exotic dancers. These women are amazing. And literally I have never spent so much money in one building except for like a Walmart or a Winco in my life. And I didn't even get nothing out of it. But like hot damn, if you've never been to a strip club, do not judge this until you go to one. Cause then you will, you'll walk in there and you'll sit down and you'll feel dirty at first. And then they're like, boo, 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 boo come to the floor or whatever. And then she busts out her moves and you don't even know what happened, but you threw all your money at this woman on a stage. You don't even know, like you don't even recognize it. The next chick comes out and you're like, shit, I have to go to the ATM. I didn't even know that I was going to give her a hundred dollars. Oh damn. And you understand why they make so much money. So this change shortage got me very feared for like my favorite pers like profession. Yep, my favorite pro pro yep, profession ever. I'm terrified for y'all women. I love you. Please don't quit. <laughs> if anything, switch to like online or like something so everybody can enjoy it for one. Because here in Idaho, we have one, Idaho Falls, we have one place to go to. I haven't been there personally, but I don't know. I know it's not what I'm going to get in California. Literally, guys, when I was there. There was this one girl up there dancing. I don't even remember any of these girls' names. But, like, it was the one girl's birthday. And she was doing this as, like, fun for, like, her birthday. We had, like, the titties and everything. Like, I legitly saw these women eat a meal from each other. <laughs> Vaginally. <laughs> and I literally was, like, in awe. And I was just throwing money at the stage. So, like, that happened. 
And so these women do a lot of things, you know, they deserve to get paid. I just fear for you. You guys deserve your money. You deserve all of it. And I just fear that y'all just, this change towards my fuck you up. And I'm just so sorry. But anyway, yep, that's what bothers me during the week. So we are going to talk about Nathaniel White. Five minutes in. See, this is take two of the show. And I just cut off like eight minutes of fucking nonsense. Because before it was like eight minutes long. So anyhow, Nathaniel White. This is picked from my number one fan on Twitter, Kenny. Literally number one fan on Twitter. You don't get better than Kenny. He makes me feel very, very good about doing this podcast. Except for I do have to say that he like spoil spoiled one of my shows for me and told me what happens. Haven't watched it yet, but it's fine. <clears throat> Kenny, now you know. I will watch it and I will I know what, what he is speaking of. But Nathaniel White. We'll get to him. So when I researched him, I found out that his ex-girlfriend, the woman he was with during his killing, raping spree, um, was on the show Evil Lives Here on the ID channel. And so I watched that. And so when I can find people who are very close to the killer and they do shows like these, I like to go off of their version of the story versus the killer's version of the story, mainly because you don't get closer to a person than the person you insert, if that makes sense. And obviously it does because we're all grown. You are very intimately close, I hope, to the person who inserts your body uh, in, in any way, shape, or form. I don't knock any freaky shit. Any way, shape, or form, hopefully y'all are close in some way, shape, or form. Anyway, so I take her story and that's what I'm going to give you. I also did print out his Wikipedia just so we can go through the Wikipedia, but mainly we're going to go through my show notes from the show. And I'm going to release this episode a day early only because... If you want to watch this episode of Evil Lives Here, you have to do it by Monday because it will expire from ID Go on Monday. So hopefully you go and watch it because this woman just needs the world to hug her because she's just so sad and holds so much guilt inside. And it's just horrible and it made me feel bad and I she had me crying at some points. Oh, man, it was crazy. Okay. So just a rundown on Nathaniel real quick. He, his name is Nathaniel White. He was born on July 28th. That's Tuesday, 28th of 1960. He was active in the Hudson Valley region of New York during the early 90s. He confessed to beating and stabbing six women to death while on parole. That's his background. So we'll go to her story. So she says that they talked on the phone for about six months he would come over on the weekends spend some time to get to know her before moving into her home because she was also a single mother of two children and so that's why she took so long to bring him into the home which I support her on I think it was awesome literally she did everything that you would normally do to protect your family she just had no control that this guy was a fucking monster so when he moves in, he ends up having a hard time finding a job. And then one morning they're having their morning coffee and whatnot. And there's a knock at the door. When she goes to answer the door, it's some cops. They say that they're there to arrest him because he robbed a store. She's like, that's impossible. He would never be that type of person to rob a store. He comes out and he's like, well, yeah, I did it because I can't find a job. You're complaining about how hard we are on money. Everything sucks right now. I had to do it. I had no choice. And so he goes to jail for a couple months. And when he gets out, she helps him get a job. He starts buying her like coochie dresses, like all the way up to her coochie, little short dresses. She is not a fan of these, but she wants to please him, obviously, because she loves this guy. So she's trying to make him happy. And I mean, who doesn't want to feel a little extra sexy from time to time? So she does. And he makes her wear one of these small little dresses to the basketball court while he's playing ball. Well, 
he's playing ball and all of a sudden she's uncomfortable right so she's not sitting there like "Ooh, look at me but she is sitting there with her back straight like i'm fucking prideful well dudes start realizing that some other dudes are around and so they're like let me holler at this chick over here he starts noticing this so nathaniel gets super mad and he tells her not to talk to other guys and that she needs to behave and she says he was like a light switch you never knew what one he was gonna be and he told her that she needs to be she needs to learn to act right like while they're in public and so like all these little things like the jealousy things like she's starting to see him but like they're not like legit red flags yet right we haven't reached like we know something might be maybe could be kind of wrong yet well one day her brother's daughter christine comes over to play with her two daughters and that's normal right cousins come over and play or whatever well they're playing tag they're roughhousing and nathaniel's playing with them and it's rough everybody admits in the situation that the, it is rough house play well she said that when christine goes home her dad calls Jill and she he tells her that she said that Nathaniel inappropriately touched her. And so while she's on the phone with her brother, she puts Nathaniel on blast. And she says, hey, this is what Christine said. Is this true? He says, no, I didn't. Maybe she was inappropriately touched, but it was innocent. It was during the game. It was not intentional. I did not do it on purpose. And her daughters at the time back him up with that story and say that like there's they didn't see him do anything that they would consider like inappropriately while playing the game. And so the brother says, okay, well, she's just not going to come over for a while. And then a couple months down the road, she goes missing, completely missing. Like she disappears. She said she was going over to a friend's house and no one ever saw her again. And so Nathaniel and Jill went over to her brother's house to help look for her so he went to that house saw these parents in mourning and scared confused everything he goes over there and he's like it's gonna be okay we'll find her i'm sure we'll find her nothing could have happened and so they it, it's months dude and it time just starts going by no one knows they everybody thinks that maybe she ran away that she was at a friend's house and she was hiding or something and so nathaniel just starts changing like he's completely changing he doesn't come home until after 10 o'clock at night she says he's always anxious he's on edge and then next thing you know the cops show up again to the house. This time they're saying a young girl says that he tried to kidnap her and that, um, hold on, I lost my place. She accepted a ride from him and when she got into the car, he would not let her leave the car. And then the first thing she did when she was able to leave the car was go to the police station and make a report. And he pleads guilty to a misdemeanor. He's in jail for less than a year. He gets a deal. And then he gets out scot-free. And then he goes back into the home. And then her friend comes over and says, Hey, I'm moving. I need moving boxes. Do you have any? And she was like, Yeah, I do. And so Nathaniel helps her. And he's like, Yeah, I'll take her the moving boxes. It's fine. And so she wants to go say goodbye and all that stuff all that good stuff and then that morning she finds out that her friend the morning she goes to go say goodbye before her friend moves she finds out that her friend's been murdered in her apartment and killed and he says that he she was fine when he left and so he doesn't know what happened she wants to go to her friend's house and check and like find out what she can find out about what's going on and he says no there's going to be too many cops he has a record and he didn't want to get accused of anything and so she knew that she wanted to go but she didn't force the issue once again she's trying to keep him happy so within the following weeks and everything else a bunch of murders are happening like girls are missing and no one knows why 
And she tells him, she's like, we need to like start locking the doors. We need to like, per we need to protect ourselves. And he says that they don't need to worry and that he will protect them. And one night he comes home with scratches on his arm, like deep, deep scratches. And he says it was from playing ball. And she was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that kind of stuff. They're grown men. They can be aggressive. So then he was the natural caregiver at night for the children because she worked at night. And so he would stay with the girls. Well, all of a sudden the girls started throwing a fit, dude, and did not want her to leave would cry and scream and beg her and she didn't understand and she even asked him she's like what is wrong with them and he says I have no idea like they're just being kids I don't know like I don't know why they're just acting that way go to work it's fine and then one day this poor woman is standing in her living room waiting and waiting for her children to come home from school they do not come home from school that day she is losing her mind. So she calls the school, right? And the school says, well, guess what? Your kids ain't fucking coming home. One of her daughters told a teacher at school that Nathaniel had been inappropriately touching them at nighttime and that the kids were not going to be coming home and that she would have to follow up with CPS to get the children back. Okay, and so she starts screaming at Nathaniel and she's like, what did you do? What have you done? And he is like, I didn't do shit. Calm down. This is all a big misunderstanding. Let's go. We'll go to the school and we'll find out what's going on. Well, they go to get in their car and their car gets surrounded. They go to the driver's side. They take him out. They arrest him. And they're saying they're going to do that. He's being investigated because of all the dead girls. And of course, she is freaking out. She's like, there's no possible way. That's not who he is. And so they go down to the station. Both of them are taken and they're both talked to for about 24 hours. And then they go in and they tell her that he has confessed to murdering all these people. Okay. She goes into straight into denial and she has no idea what they're talking about. The cops are like, well, we're going to take you home now. And while they're going home and driving to the house, they, she drives by Nathaniel on the side of the road in an orange jumpsuit. And he's out there on the property showing the cops evidence and like where the bodies are and stuff. And so she said that she was just like, and that's when she was like, this has to be true. Cause why else would he be out there? And so everything just started to click everything like all the things that happened in the past and this woman is completely destroyed she's devastated dude she was the one who constantly like stuck up for him defended him had his back and everything and just for him to do this to her was literally devastating and so she decides to go to her parents house to get out of that house because she can't stand to be in there and that's when they learn the awful, awful God truth of like legitly everything that's happening. And it's on TV and she starts questioning then and there, like, why didn't he kill me? Why did he kill these poor women and not me? And it was just so hard for her to understand. And I don't blame her. It must have been. And so she's watching him confess on the TV. He's confessing and he's blaming all of his crimes on watching RoboCop 2. That's what <laughs> RoboCop 2. Who the fuck pays attention to the sequel? Jesus. Anywho. So he confesses to everything and tells her that like he doesn't tell her. He tells the fucking world. That's why I had to stop. Because, like, he doesn't tell her. He tells the world. Because he's on the news. <laughs> that he gets joy out of doing it. And it stimulates him. And it's like a dream. And then when it's over is when he feels remorse. And that's when he feels sorry. And then he says, I couldn't help. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. 
And then while they're watching this on the TV, the phone rings and her brother is at the parents' house too at that point in time. And when the phone rings, her brother gets a call from the cops, right? And the cops say that he also confessed to being the one who killed her niece and that his her niece is his youngest victim and so he confesses to all of this she goes to her niece's funeral right and some people are blaming her and asking her how she couldn't have known the brother doesn't really talk to her he does like there's like a news clipping where like she's crying and her brother goes and like helps console her a little bit but she said ever since then this her and her brother are just really not the same they're destroyed the relationship that they had obviously and so she goes while he's in jail and she goes to talk to him and confront him and he says that he was told to lie he was forced to lie and that it was a mis it was all a mistake well she gets her daughters back and there just wasn't enough apologies in the world to ever restore the bond that they had and the like the connection that her and her daughters had and so that they have come leaps and bounds from where they were originally but still the bond will is never the same and that they all live in fear that one day nathaniel could get out and that if he does get out then they are almost 100 percent sure that they will be his next victims and they're very confident in that which is super sad and he was sentenced to 150 years in prison. He has been asking for parole, though, and trying to get parole. And that's why she lives in fear. And she said she had to learn from it and move on. And learning from it pretty much means that she blames herself for all of this horribleness. And so to give you better dates on, like, they don't go into, like, the legit dates on the episode so like i told you his he said that his killings were inspired by watching robocop 2 which by the way if anybody's ever seen robocop shout out to the first one but the second one that's the one you want to be inspired by who the hell goes off the sequel just saying especially back then like the first movie was like the best movie and then they follow it up with like the sequel and it never has the same people it's always different it's always less quality never go off of the sequel jesus christ but he said quote the first girl i killed was from Ro the robocop movie i seen him cut someone's throat and then take the knife down and slit them all the way down from their chest to their stomach and leave their body in a certain position I did this with the first victim I killed. I did exactly what I saw in the movie. His first killing took place on March 25th, 1991. And he had been convicted of abducting the 16-year-old girl. Like I said, she was only 16 years old. He didn't, like, I got on probation for that. And that's the parole that he was on when he started committing these other crimes so he was paroled out in april of 1992 and he returned to orange county new york and after his parole the first legit victim he had was his niece's girlfriend and he killed her in the end of june and then he killed four more others by the end of july 1992 um so julian Jillian, oh, Jillian and Frank, Jillian Franks, Frank was his first victim and she was 29 years old of Middletown. She was pregnant with her third child and she was killed in 91. Her naked body was found on the side of the road Ro oh, railroad tracks, sorry, abandoned railroad tracks in Milltown. And then his first parole, first victim after parole was 
Christine, the 14-year-old niece who had just finished 8th grade, and she disappeared on June 1st, and her family reported her missing on July 1st of 1992, and her body was discovered off of Eco, Echo Lake Road in Goshen, New York on August 4th. Loretta was 34 years old of Milltown. She was killed July 10th. She was found in her home by the police. She was the mother of three children. This was her friend that he murdered. And so, even worse, he kills her one of her best friends. So she has to live with that. Now he's killed her niece and her best friend. And so, just think about that. Think about being the spouse of this fucking monster. How horrible. So, like I said, she was found in her home and just absolute horribleness. Angela Hopkins and Brenda Whiteside are cousins. They were both murdered in, oh, y'all got me, Panipski? Y'all got me fucked up. Yeah, we'll go with that. Panipski, New York, on June 20th, 1992. They were last seen leaving a bar with him in his pickup truck, and their bodies were found on off of Harrisman Drive in an abandoned farmhouse in Goshen on August 4th. Their cause of death was blunt force, blunt force trauma to their face and their head. And last but not least, horribly, his last victim was Andrea, Andrea Hunter from Milltown, and she was stabbed to death in the early mornings of July 30th, 1992. Her body was discovered in Goshen a day later, and she was 27 years old. Her charred remains were found at the restaurant. So, during their investigation, Angela's sister, the part of the cousins, she's the one who told cops that he was the last one seen with her sister and her cousin. And so that's when they start looking into them. And they don't really, like, they don't really necessarily believe this is a guy right off the bat so that's why he is able to be do all this they begin their investigation on june 30th after the last body was found they suspected then that he might be related for all of them because obviously now they have a name and so maybe this guy is the guy who's doing all of this and so they start looking into him on August 2nd, he returned to the Blue Note where he was identified and arrested by the cousin, by the sister of the two cousins. So she identifies him and says he is the one that was there. When they arrest him at the home and take him back to the police station, he confesses. And then that's when he takes the cops to Goshen on August 4th. And he was indicted by a grand jury on August 7th for the mur murder of her niece. On September 9th, the five murders were also indicted, also added to the indictment. He was charged with six counts of second degree murder and pled not guilty by the reason of insanity. But that did not work because he tried to use the whole good old fashioned TV made me do it like a punk ass motherfucker. Well, he was convicted on all counts, on all counts, on April 14th, 1993. And he was, like I said, he was sentenced by Judge Jeffrey Berry to 150 years to life. And he is being held in the correctional facility. And so his case was cited by the New York governor at the time in defense 
to push his the rehabilit the re putting into I can't reinstating there we go I couldn't think of that word the reinstating of the death penalty which I think if anybody de deserves to die it would be good old Nathaniel White because who who does that even like murdering six women obviously is absolutely fucking heinous but to kill your girlfriend's niece to kill her best friend. You not only just killed her niece or her best friend. You devastated this woman for the rest of her days. She will never be the same. You know damn well in your head that you made this woman fear for the rest of her life. And that carry that guilt and anguish around with her. How could she to look? I have a million siblings. And to look at one of them and to know that, like, the person I brought was the reason why their child isn't around is horrible. And to do that, he needs to fry on that basis alone. This poor woman. And she is just, in the episode, I was bawling with her because, like I've said before multiple times, I hate when people take on the guilt and the responsibility of these horrible, absolute monsters no one can control these monsters. It is not your job to change a monster. And he would have been a monster no matter what she would have ever done. He just happened to inflict his monsterness upon her family. And that is just devastating and horrible. And then, like, to be so lost in love and, like, not see all the things in front of you and, like, Anybody's anybody who's ever been in love has been there. Like any guy who's ever fallen in love with a crazy bitch or any chick who's ever fallen in love with a psycho dude. They're not psycho and crazy when you first get with them. It takes a couple weeks, months or whatever before true colors, before we get comfortable enough that we're like, okay, I'm going to flip the script and I'm going to get crazy and let's just see if you stay or if you go. And he, he eased her into his controlling and his craziness and his manipulating of her that it worked. And unfortunately, it was sad. And her niece passed, her best friend passed, and three other people passed away at this man's hand. So it's just horrible. And I just felt super bad. And they don't have a lot on this guy, except for obviously that he used... Robocop 2 as inspiration, which I just can't get over that. But there are some things you can watch. You can watch the 1990 episode of A&E's investigative reports called Copycat Crimes. And you go to YouTube and just put in Copycat Crimes. And it's one of the episodes. Don't put in the investigation reports. You won't find it. Believe me. And then, like I said, you can go to the ID channel and her episode is I is called I Invited Him In. It expires Monday. Remember that. Monday, the 27th, a day before Nathaniel's birthday, it expires. So go watch it. It is the season four, episode one. I Invited Him In on the Discovery Channel. And... He is still alive till this very day. He's chilling. And he is going to have a birthday here soon. So, yeah. The crime span of his crimes was from March 25th, 1991 and July 30th, 1992 in New York City. And he was apprehended and taken into custody on August 2nd, 1992. Bam, bam, bam. Just like that. So, yeah. That's Nathaniel White, guys. Super, super disturbing guy. And I just, I can't get over the fact that he killed her niece or her best friend. Like, that just is too much. And they tore down... His house and the farmhouse. You can go on YouTube and there are a couple of episodes of different people going into the home before it was torn down. 
and they take you and walk you through the house and like there's like Nathaniel White was a pussy ass bitch on the wall and stuff it's really poetic and everything but the house was torn down and I'll post a picture of it it's super fucking creepy I don't ever wish that to be the last sight of anybody's life because ugh, super super scary but yeah hopefully you liked it and Kenny hopefully you liked it so let me know and please girl don't blame yourself this man was a piece of shit and I hope to god you and your brother can restore your relationship because my relationship with my brother is amazing and I love my brother and I couldn't imagine not having him and so girl please Ugh. this piece of shit that's all so horrible so so horrible but follow me on instagram at it is what it is pod 19 all together no spaces on twitter it is what it is 208 because that's where i'm from on facebook and youtube it is what it is a true crime podcast and tuesday will also be a show review day and so will thursday because i have watched something that has devastated me literally had me crying we have a good wrongful conviction coming up and it was just amazing and I stumbled upon it and I will tell you what it is when we get there. So on Tuesday, that's what we'll do. So everybody, please have a good day. Enjoy your early episode. Watch this episode and yeah, keep it classy. Bye.